In this session, we are going to investigate post-impressionism. I'm going to take a strategy similar to the way that I covered Impressionism. We'll start off first with the critical ideas and look at them through the lens of Paul Cezanne's works because he was a seminal influence. Then, in later sessions, we'll move on to the influence of symbolist theory, the very important and controversial notions of the primitive in art, and finally end up with an investigation of the popular but somewhat mythical notion of the modern artist. To begin, we need to return to Impressionism. By the 1890s, Claude Monet's haystacks were a rousing success, but Impressionism was no longer the leading avant-garde movement in France, and in fact, it had come under a lot of criticism. Given the growing modern interest in progress and change, however, it shouldn't have been a surprise. Just like everyone else, artists and critics were accustomed to expecting new styles and fashion and innovations in science and industry to appear on a regular basis. Why would they have been totally content with any one approach to art and art making? And what exactly were their criticisms? To begin, some were concerned that Impressionist paintings like Garden at Bethay relied too heavily on transitory impressions and the execution resulted in formless compositions. Those sketchy brushstrokes that were especially associated with painters like Monet, the ones that produced such a new and visually compelling aesthetic and what we now consider iconic examples of Impressionism, they were coming under attack. Some artists argued that the Impressionist focus on plein air painting and optical effects, which you see here, was too limiting that it made them too dependent on what they saw and discouraged true artistic freedom and expressiveness. They asked, wasn't this an approach that was more concerned with registering a specific subject rather than interpreting or responding to that subject? Others believe that Impressionist work was too improvisational, too rushed, too rapidly executed, and therefore too accidental. Look at Bert Marisot's painting. Their concerns focused on those brushstrokes that suggest form rather than construct it, and the apparent speed with which the painting was done. I don't mean this in terms of hours or days, but in terms of how quickly the brush moved on the canvas. Paul Cezanne would associate this kind of rapid painting with a less intellectual approach to art. Copying in any form was treacherous territory. Mimesis might have been successful with the applied arts, with textile design or china painting, but fine art was supposed to be a nobler calling, and documenting a scene or a subject was increasingly associated with photography. For some critics, the domestic subjects of Impressionist paintings, such as gardens and flowers and mothers and children, coupled with a practice that was characterized by quick, often idiosyncratic brushstrokes and an unyielding insistence on painting what the light depicted seemed too superficial, too sensory, too feminine. These were not qualities historically associated with good painting or conscious intellectual effort. In 1896, a posthumous retrospective was held of Bert Marisot's work. She had recently died, and her status within the Impressionist group was solidly established through hundreds of paintings which showcased her virtuosity and what some people considered the most Impressionist brushstroke of all. Camille Mauclair, a prominent critic for La Nouvelle Review, attended the show. Mauclair liked the subject matter of Impressionism, and he applauded the sensitivity to the subject that Impressionists showed, as well as their rejection of academic standards. He was, however, concerned that Impressionists relied too heavily on realist notions, on the rendering of immediate experiences, and he thought that they had lapsed into materialism, crass materialism. Obviously, too much success with the public worried the critic, as it had the Impressionist artist Pizarro, who complained that Monet would paint pictures like haystacks, 
because that is what the buyers wanted. Additionally, Mauclair did not see sufficient imagination in Impressionism. The works struck him as thoughtless mechanical activity, lacking any intellectual exercise, so he wrote that Impressionism was dead. It was history, an art form that had lived off its own sensuality and had now died of it. It was at most a record of immediate sensory impulses, which smacked of decadence and superficiality. He finished his scathing review by labeling Impressionism as largely a feminine art, perfectly suited to Bert Marisot, but not sufficiently intellectual for male artists. Mauclair's comments raise a variety of issues for modern art. The focus on formal issues to the exclusion of subject matter. The role of the critic as a voice of authority and taste. The relationship of the public to fine art. And this is tricky because identifying the public is always problematic, as is speaking for them. Already there was evidence that the elitist nature of fine art was threatened by paintings that in some way were understood to be too consumable and understandable by the public. The issue of materialism that surfaced first with Pissarro, who lamented that Monet would literally paint for money, was echoed by Mauclair. The distinctions about images that separated fine art from design, from commercial art, from decorative art, were threatened with a growing consumer culture and the proliferation of imagery throughout the culture. Finally, the definition of artist was also beginning to shift from the bourgeois educated painter to a more dangerous stereotype of the tortured, sexual, and sensitive male artist. Whatever inroads Bert Marisot and Mary Cassatt had made for women artists was drowned in the criticism of Impressionism as a feminine approach. One way to understand these criticisms might be by saying that Impressionism lacked structure, conscious intention, artistic control, and imagination. The artist was too much at the mercy of what he saw, too concerned with optical effects, too grounded in nature. This was the position of artists and critics who aligned themselves with new approaches to painting that the English critic Roger Fry was calling post-impressionism by 1910. There are many ways to talk about post-impressionism, but let's start off with some of the main ideas. I think that Cezanne's still lifes offer the best example to understanding post-impressionism as a critique of impressionism. Not only did the artist produce many paintings, he wrote and talked about process and intention and function. His influence and advice for other post-impressionists was so pervasive that he is often referred to as the father of modern art. True, that is a patriarchal title, and one conferred by an earlier 20th century male-dominated authority, but at the very least, it identifies Cezanne's works and theories as critical to turn-of-the-century modern ideas. Let's start with Still Life with Apples a painting that he worked on for four years, from 1890 to 1894. The subject could not be any more mundane. A table, a white cloth, apples spilling out of a straw basket, a bottle of wine, some bread on a plate. This was the commonest kind of subject matter. It showed no great stories, no important heroes, and no dramatic action. What is so compelling about a simple still life of things that the artist literally had hanging around the house? Unlike the idiosyncratic brushstrokes that often characterize an impressionist work, this painting is executed through carefully structured forms that are shaped and defined by color, not contour, and color that often works independently of reality. Look closely at the fruit, the bread, and the tablecloth. Can you tell what kinds of apples or bread? What texture of fabric? In fact, had the artist not included apples in the title, you might have been tempted to think you were looking at ripe peaches 
or green plums. One fruit even seems shaped like a pear. What about the table? Its ends don't match up. One side is decidedly higher than the other. That's odd. It's tilted at a strange angle against the picture plane and depicted with splotches of blue and yellow, and on the left side it looks as though the crumpled cloth has sunk into the tabletop. The wine bottle is leaning. The basket is perched against what seems to be a book, and shouldn't those apples be toppling to the floor? Even the back wall is a mottled blur of blue and green, yellow and pink. All Saison still lifes have the same artificial quality, and there is no interest in mimicking nature. This is a combination of several factors. The abandonment of academic perspective that made the audience read the painting as a believable three-dimensional space. Notice in this painting of onions in a bottle that not only does the table tilt, but it is more slanted on the right and shallower on the left, and somehow one end juts through the cloth at the far corner. That knife in the center almost serves as a dividing point for two slightly different but very apparent perspectives. Then there are the forms. It could almost be read as a grouping of forms that have been deliberately positioned to make you aware of their shapes and the relationship of one shape to another. The brim of the glass is not completed, allowing the bowl of the glass to merge with the wall. Finally, we come to the color, a wall which seems mottled because of the broad brush strokes that lap and intersect each other. The onions have none of the transparency you'd expect. They are solid, almost velvety in texture. The colors don't correspond to what you would logically expect. What is Cezanne trying to tell us? To make us feel. He is painting very real subjects, but perhaps reality is something that cannot be pinned down or painted. Does it change? He often spent years working on the same painting, and during that time, the fruit could have rotted or been replaced. The light certainly would have changed. Maybe he moved the table or propped it up to get a different perspective or changed where he put his easel. Perhaps he wasn't painting just one exact moment, but a whole series of moments that he lived through and painted through. Isn't that what life and reality are? Moments and people and places and things that we live through, respond to, walk away from, and then return to? Things do get dusty and dried up and rotten and replaced. Perhaps Cezanne was using very ordinary things to talk about some very extraordinary ideas. Cezanne saw no reason for an artist to reproduce exactly what he saw. That might have taken great skill, but it was very mimetic. What he could do was far more important. He could represent reality as he experienced it, reacted to it, engaged with it. He could make people think about reality in new ways and use a new aesthetic. That meant a specific defining of artistic subjectivity and beauty. By subjectivity, I mean the individual feelings and perceptions of the artist. Not a quick response to light or climate, but a thoughtful reflection on their qualities, on their value. Take this very famous painting that he did, Still Life with Blue Vase. By now you are probably looking for those signature Cezanne approaches. They are almost like clues to guide you. The vase blurs beyond its outline, and the plate behind it is fuzzy and asymmetrical. The fruit looks both sketched and painted, and I'd be hard-pressed to say exactly what it is. The wall is split, and the angle at which he painted it seems to move the eye rapidly down to the lower right. There's a hint of another room, maybe a bed. Everything is suggested but hidden, which makes us want to look more, look closer. Think about what odd angles and changes in perspective, outlines, and blurs tell you about how you see. Against the angles and the split wall and tilting table, that blue vase stands like a sentry, its flowers like spreading wings. Everywhere you look, 
If you look closely, there is blue and orange, sometimes bright, sometimes faded, sometimes blended or brush-like stripes across the canvas. Had he painted that still life using academic perspective and a single light source, detailing the exact surfaces of ceramic and wood, wall and flower, it would have been a pretty picture. But because he didn't, it is compellingly beautiful. Beauty is a complex concept, but try thinking about it this way. Beauty is that which is so compelling that we cannot look away. We are drawn to it. We find more in it than its surface. Beauty can be soothing or frightening, overwhelming in its seductiveness or blatant in its harshness, satisfying in its completion, frustrating in its deliberate ability to confuse. For Cezanne, beauty and creativity were expressed through color and form. This meant contemplation about the subject, about color, about relationships between forms, about execution. It was a most intellectual approach, a thinking approach to representation which could not be rushed. Tilting a bowl of cherries caused the viewer to stop, to register the deliberate inaccuracy, to look more closely and to think about what was depicted and what it meant, something that Cezanne clearly thought Impressionist painting failed to do. Whether he was painting a still life or a landscape like the Bay from the Star, Cezanne questioned the fixed notion of how we see and therefore the reality of what we see. In landscapes, he often painted from a high vantage point or from far away, much like the Impressionists had with those city scenes. But rather than focus on the optical effects of light and climate and distance, Cezanne pointedly focused on color to make form. Forms like rooftops and mountains, steeples and chimneys. He cut through the details and emphasized the essential forms and their compositional relationships. For both, color became the emotional and the aesthetic carrier of meaning. And you can see from his work that color often operates independent of form and composition. And by that I mean that the colors do not necessarily correspond to the subjects depicted. He painted the sense of this bayside village with its jumbled houses and the colors that sun and shadow could make on them. The mountains seem both transparent with the paled colors and substantial with the stronger hues and brushstrokes. Color, structure, and form were his trilogy. And through them, he communicated notions about nature, about life, about reality, about art. Color, structure, and form were his trinity. And through them, he communicated notions about nature, about life, about reality, about art. Where Impressionists had painted the immediacy of life, Cezanne questioned the whole notion of experience. In doing so, he inserted new questions about art and the artist as well as the viewer. Was reality really seen from a single viewpoint? How does an artist effectively represent the multiplicity of representations and experiences? How does an artist make visible a set of compositional relationships? Did objects have essential forms? And could these be interpreted? For Cezanne, representation of anything was a carefully negotiated area between knowledge and subjectivity. There is nothing rushed or accidental or whimsical about his work, regardless of colors or forms. His technique, even if you didn't know that he was a notoriously slow painter, appears as deliberate and consciously made as a mason laying stone. These factors contribute the solidity of the work and the nearly monumental sense of importance that clings to these pictures of fruit and bottles and trees and houses.
that abound with a natural colors, with skies composed of hatching and vegetation that resonates with the same colors and textures as the houses and paths it shares pictorial space with. Nothing floats in Cezanne's works, and even the palest hues contribute to a palpable sense of structure. For the artist, this negotiation represents the insertion of structure in artistic subjectivity. It involves a rigorous intellectual contemplation of the subject, as well as an individual emotional response to it. Cezanne believed in inner and essential harmonies in nature which he thought art needed to reflect. Again, note that a belief in inner harmonies and essential natures was important in the 19th century world. Grounding oneself in these notions influenced politics, domestic relations, the economy, class distinctions, even science. For Cezanne to integrate such truisms into art made perfect sense. It should also be apparent that such a theoretical position about structure, about color, about form, coupled with a painting approach that privileged rational and deliberate choices, effectively protected post-impressionism from the criticisms leveled at impressionism. It was also an implicit assertion that a post-impressionist approach to art was a serious approach, as serious as any academic artist at the time. One of Cezanne's favorite subjects was Mont Saint Victoire, a magnificent peak in the Provence area where he lived. He made over 50 paintings of this site. That should remind you of Monet's practice of painting the same subjects over and over again. For both artists, regardless of their different approaches, it is clear that they believed there was great value in returning to the same subject. We're going to look at three of these paintings, and as a group they offer an insight into his growing interest in abstraction and structure, which were two areas that would be highly influential on 20th century Cubism. He spent nearly a decade working on this canvas before he considered it finished. Again, remember that this wasn't 10 years of focusing on just one painting, but 10 years of thinking and revising before the finished work represented what he wanted the paint to do. That's all he had, really, paint, and he asked a lot of it. It's quite a limited palette that he used, and you can see the same colors repeated over and over across the canvas. You can see that the mountain, the valley, the vegetation and trees, as well as the houses dotting the village, are executed in broad, obvious brushstrokes that intersect, overlap, parallel, and butt up against each other. He used yellow to represent vegetation, but also mountainous indentations and structures. Using just a few colors allowed him to create an image of a particular place that seems very organic, despite the combination of naturally occurring things, like the mountain, and made things, like the houses. These are paintings with neither photographic nor naturalistic realism. Like the earlier still lifes, they represent a shift from art that is representational, that is, subjects look like what they are in the real world, to art that is non-illustrative. That is, what is depicted can represent an ideal, an emotion, a response. This is a change from the perceptual, which is what Cezanne believed Impressionism accomplished, to the conceptual. It's a change from painting the empirical world to painting the world of ideas. In this 1897 version, he has eliminated many of the details that he had been using. The mountain is almost outlined as if he were giving the peak a profile, and he further separates it from everything else by painting it in a much cooler palette. He has created the sense of height and depth through horizontal and diagonal brushstrokes rather than contouring. 
Trees and vegetation are given recognizable forms and colors, but there is no sense of what is close or distance, since he used the same kind of brushstrokes in both. The structures and fields have been merged into forms that retain both the echo of geometric and organic shapes. This could be a comment on what the people built and cultivated in comparison to what occurred naturally. Even today, the Provence area is largely agricultural, and you can drive for miles seeing primarily countryside, punctuated by small towns, fields, and orchards. Cezanne was never particularly content in Paris, and perhaps his dedication to the Provence countryside and the enduring grandeur of Mont Saint-Victoire is a homage to one of France's most beautiful natural areas. That kind of consideration certainly would have been a concern for many people living in cities who longed to escape, if only for a holiday, to more rural areas. The way that he painted, the focus on color and form, was a way of personalizing the site. That would be the artistic subjectivity. It also called attention to the importance and beauty of this famous mountain. It encouraged the viewer to see in that what Cezanne believed in. This highly structured approach, where color was less an avenue to describe reality and more an avenue to understand emotion and ideas about the subject, was what fascinated critics. It's easy to see how critics and artists would be so interested in the possibility that formal issues like line, color, shape, composition, and texture have in shaping meaning and aesthetics. It's also important to remember that today we are accustomed to seeing all kinds of images in both fine art and popular culture in every imaginable medium. We don't necessarily expect or even value that which is highly representational or exactly descriptive. This was not the case in the late 19th century. Audiences which had just become accustomed to Impressionist work were now seeing a much different interpretation of literally the same old subject matter, landscape and still life. This is one of my favorite Cezanne paintings, Mont Saint-Victoire and the Chateau Noir, from 1904 to 1906. It's one that demonstrates his virtuosity in using deliberate brushstrokes to construct form and meaning. Focus on the vegetation, the mountain, and the sky, because they dominate the canvas. At first it appears that the painting is executed through swirls of color. But if you look closely, you will see that what look like swirls are the result of overlapping and parallel and competing geometric brushstrokes. He has broken everything down to essential forms. The Chateau Noir is solidly depicted in bright yellow and orange and in quite simple squares and rectangles. By comparison, everything else, which is nature, is the result of complex compositional relationships of essential form and color, layers of color. I'm not sure exactly the spot he selected to paint this, but he consciously created a painting with a specific vantage point for the viewer. It's right between the overhanging branches and the underlying vegetation. It's a created position, a conscious position, a very intentional position, and I'm sure that Cezanne expected the viewer to do more than just look. Let's sum up a brief list of some common characteristics of post-impressionist painting, which I'm going to remind you is not a style, but an approach. There's an interest in structure and intentionality and in using color as an emotional and aesthetic carrier of meaning. There's a shift from the perceptual to the conceptual from the empirical world to painting ideas about the world. There's a growing disinterest in recreating or mimicking nature. There's a growing interest in the primacy of artistic subjectivity and an individual artistic vision. And finally, there's a growing interest in abstraction and in seeking commonalities between Western and non-Western 
approaches to art. Before we leave, we should take a moment to talk about Cezanne, the artist. People often assume that artists pluck inspiration out of thin air, which is what makes studying Cezanne's work so critical. There is nothing haphazard about them. There is almost a scientific rigor and process and development to what he did, and that would be a very modern position. He lived in a world where science was coming up with new ideas about how the brain functioned, new ideas on optical theory. Of course he would pay attention to that. His work was visual, and he was interested in new theories like binocular vision. There were also new disciplines like psychology and sociology starting, disciplines which were trying to explain how people thought and interacted. Just because he was a painter did not mean that he ignored new ideas or that he was out of touch with his world. On the contrary, he was extremely well educated and had studied law before becoming an artist. Undoubtedly, that educational background made him think about art. As a seminal artist of the avant-garde and one of the critical influences on 20th century Cubism, Cezanne clearly occupies a strategic position. Later romanticizations of the artist have unfortunately cast him as a model for the stereotypical but highly mythological modern artist, who is often described as aloof, disinterested, antisocial, isolated, and totally immersed in his work, regardless of the cost of personal relationships, family life, or reputation. It is true that as a young artist, he was on the outs with the avant-garde crowd. He was described as gruff, antisocial, often he intentionally dressed poorly. On the other hand, he was the son of a banker, and his ability to move to Aix-en-Provence as an adult and spend the bulk of his professional life there without financial worries came from a generous inheritance. He battled with diabetes from 1890, and the illness affected his personality and his relationships with many people, including the eventual disintegration of his marriage. On the other hand, a steady stream of artists trekked from Paris to visit and confer with him, to listen to his critiques and theories, and since he had been trained as a lawyer, he was articulate, if a bit of a curmudgeon. At the end, it is important to let his work speak. I suspect that is what he intended all along. In our next session, we are going to look at symbolist theories and the way that symbolist theory influenced the late 19th century, especially the way that it shaped our mainstream notions of the modern artist.